Exodus chapter number 26. We'll just begin reading in verse 31. The Bible says, And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work. With cherubims shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it upon the four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil of the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony of the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table on the north side. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. We thank you for the good singing. Lord, we're thankful for Calvary. Lord, if it wasn't for Calvary, we'd all be headed to hell. And God, we're thankful for Calvary. It's where God made a way for sinners to be saved. Where the darling Son of God hung and bled and died and shed His life's blood for the propitiation of our sins. And God, we certainly bless you and praise you and thank you for Calvary. And then, God, we're thankful. Lord, after you save us, Lord, you also carry us. You carry our burdens. You carry our, our heartaches. And, Lord, you carry us many times. Lord, we're thankful that you're a God that's a present help in time of need. And, God, we're certainly thankful for the good singing. Lord, we do... Uh, Lord, uh, our hearts are, over, are just overjoyed at some that have been sick and some that have been traveling, some that have been gone back with us tonight. What a blessing. Lord, we do pray for those that are sick. We do pray for those that are providentially hindered tonight. We do pray for Brother Clint's father. You continue to touch him. Thank you for the good report and that he's doing good. And I pray you continue to help him to heal. I pray and thank you for the good report from the little's daughter. And I pray that you would continue to be with Miss Andrea and God uh, help her. And then, Father, we certainly pray for this uh, family of this couple that was killed in a car wreck uh, this evening on 36. I pray for that family. And God, you're the God of all comfort, and I pray you'd comfort them. And I pray that, Lord, any in that family that are not saved would get saved as a result of this terrible, terrible accident. And then, Father, we do pray for Miss Brooke Longworth. And, Lord, you know what a blessing she's been to us throughout the years. And God, I hate to hear she's sick, and I pray you'd touch her. I pray you give the doctors wisdom, and Lord, I pray that you'd help that uh, dear saint of God. Now, God, help us tonight from the Word of God. Help us to ever draw close to Christ. God, open our hearts, open our minds. And God, speak to us. God, without your touch, we, we will not be able to accomplish anything, for without you, we can do nothing. So we're asking you to use this unworthy vessel. Help your people. God, save that one nearest hell. And Father, we'll bless you for it. For it's in the holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, we find in Exodus chapters 20 through chapter 39 that God is instructing Moses. Uh, God calls Moses in the beginning of Exodus to lead his people out of Egypt. And then God sends Moses down there and does that very feat. And he uses... Uh, great miracles to get his people out of Egypt. And just like God, they were not only delivered out of Egypt, but they were delivered with all the spoils of Egypt. And can I say, friend, when we get out of this old world and step off into glory, wait till you see what God's got in store for us. Uh, but we find that uh, as they begin to journey in the wilderness, you know the Red Sea experience where God drowns all of Pharaoh's army, uh, uh, you know the bitter waters of Mara. They go three days journey without water. They get to where there's water and it's bitter. Uh, and they begin to murmur and complain. And, and uh, God tells Moses, throw a stick in the water. And when he did, the waters were healed and they were sweet to drink. Uh, that's a picture of Calvary. Uh, we had a bitter life of sin till uh, uh, the wonderful cross of Calvary came into play. And then uh, when you trust in Christ, your life becomes sweet. Uh, and we thank the Lord. And, and we know that uh, 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 there is the wilderness journey, uh, but uh, Moses spends about 40 days on the mountaintop with God, uh, 
in the book of Exodus. And while he's on the mountaintop, uh, God begins to deal with him concerning his children. Uh, can I say, first of all, he instructs Moses in the commandments. Uh, or in the law. You know, he comes down with the tables uh, 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 written by the hand of God with the Ten uh, uh, Commandments, and later God gives him uh, 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 over 600, nearly 700 more commandments uh, 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 for his people. So he instructs him in the commandments in the law uh, uh, so his people knows uh, what pleases God and what displeases God. Uh, he instructs him uh, 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 in all kinds of law, uh, dietary law. We don't like that around here. Uh, moral law, uh, uh, civil law, uh, everything that they would need to know. Uh, and the law was given as our schoolmaster to bring us to the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge of sin. Uh, so we know what God uh, uh, looks at as sin. Uh, so he instructs him in the commandments. Uh, he also instructs Moses in ceremonial worship. He begins to deal with Moses on how man can worship God. Uh, and can I say, there is no greater privilege than to be able to worship Almighty God. That's why God made us, that we would reverence Him and worship Him because we choose to reverence and worship Him. He made us a free moral agent to worship Him. But then we find that God also instructs Moses on the construction of the tabernacle. He not only tells them how to have ceremonial worship, but also he explains in grave detail how to construct the tabernacle. Can I say everything was done precisely and for a purpose? God never ever does anything because he's bored. He always does things very distinctly and very detailed. And everything in the tabernacle had its purpose, and everything in the tabernacle represents uh, something far greater than what uh, it initially looked like. And so with all that in mind, in these verses in Exodus 26 that we read, I want to uh, just bring you a little thought tonight on the importance of the veil the importance of the veil. Uh, let me say, first of all, in Exodus 26, God has given Moses the instructions for the veil of the tabernacle. The veil of the tabernacle. I just told you, he's given Moses uh, all the details and all the blueprint on how to construct the tabernacle. And when you get to verse uh, chapter 26... Uh, 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 he's uh, 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 talking about uh, a lot in the tabernacle. And in verses uh, 31 and 32 and 33, specifically, he's dealing with the veil. Can I say, uh, the construction of the veil of the tabernacle consisted, first of all, it had to be about the width of a man's hand, four to six inches thick. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a little curtain like what you have hanging up in your house. It had to be four to six inches thick, the width of a man's hand. There was no light to be able to pervade through the veil. You could not see light pass through it. They say, why? I'll get to that in a second. As we find in verse 31, and the veil was to be made of three colors, blue, purple, and scarlet. We find that it's to be made of fine twine linen in verse 31. That's very important because when you go looking at the wedding garment in Revelation 19, it is fine twined linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. Mm -hmm. We also find that the veil uh, not only had to be fine twined linen, four to six inches thick, uh, that was to be uh, blue, purple, and scarlet. We find in verse 31 that it was to have a cherubim uh, uh, that was to be embroidered on it. The cherubims were to be embroidered on it. Very important. If you uh, understand the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat had two cherubim on top of it. Looking down uh, over the mercy seat. We find that uh, within the veil... It was to separate the holy place from the most holy place, or what is commonly referred to as the Holy of Holies. And within the Holy of Holies 
was where the Ark of the Covenant was to be kept. The Ark of the Covenant was to have the tables uh, uh, from Moses uh, of the law. It was to have a, a pot of manna, and it was to have the rod that budded, showing that Aaron's Levitical priest line uh, was the priest line that God had called. Uh, and we find that the Ark of the Covenant was in, kept in the most holy place, uh, and the veil separated uh, 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 the holy from the most holy. Only the high priest was allowed to go behind the veil into where the Ark of the Covenant was. Uh, and once a year, he'd have to take blood and sprinkle on the mercy seat. Uh, and friend, I don't have time to tell you all that went into that, uh, but there was a great ceremony that went from uh, how he was dressed uh, uh, to how the lamb was to be slain, uh, how the lamb was to be observed for 14 days, uh, how the blood was to be uh, uh, gathered, how he was to wash himself after the lamb was slain, uh, how he was to dress before he went into the most holy place. Uh, and when he went in, if everything was done according to how God instructed Moses, uh, God was pleased uh, the Shekinah glory of God would fall and would uh, 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 receive the blood on the mercy seat uh, and the sins of the people of Israel were pushed back for a year if he didn't do it right his life was taken from him every high priest when he went within the veil they said on the, uh, uh, on the hem of his uh, a uh, royal priest robe uh, uh, was either bells or, or uh, uh, pomegranate uh, shells that would uh, cling together. Uh, and so that uh, uh, when they would stop hearing those clinging, they knew he was dead and they had a rope tied to him. They'd just drag him out, appoint another high priest, and start the process all over again. I preached a message years ago on Within the Veil. Can you imagine just getting an anointed as the next high priest and now you've got to go? Uh, can you imagine the reservation? Can you imagine making certain you did everything, followed every ingredient, did everything exactly right? Because you just seen what happened to the last guy. And by the way, you know what happened to the last guy? Why it happened? He took for granted. He'd been, he'd been back there a few times before and it wasn't no big deal to him anymore. He might have skipped a step or two. Uh, might cause you to think a little bit. You come to church so much, you might take it for granted. You don't know what you might be missing. That's a whole other message, but that'll preach a little bit. Uh, but this high priest would go in once, and you see, my dear friends, when he was back there and the Shekinah glory would fall, he would see the glory of God, but the glory of God was not to pervade out into the holy place. That's why the veil had to be so thick. The only glory they got to see was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But we see that that's the veil of the tabernacle. But my dear friends, nothing that God does for the tabernacle was just for the physical part of it. I want you to see the typology of the veil. Everything in the tabernacle is a picture of something else. Can I say that the veil is a picture of the work of Jesus Christ? It's always a picture of Christ. Matter of fact, every facet with the exception of the oil in the tabernacle is a picture of some form or fashion of what Jesus Christ did for you and I. Can I say, first of all, when looking at the typology of the veil, let's look at the colors. We find again they are blue, they are scarlet, and they are purple. The colors represent the Trinity. Blue represents our heavenly position and our heavenly character. That's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Purple always represents royalty. That's a picture of the Father. The scarlet is always a picture of blood atonement. That's a picture of Jesus Christ the Son who paid for our sins uh, with His own blood. Uh, I want you to see the other ty typology. Again, that fine twine linen 
is always a picture of God's grace through faith. My dear friends, the only way anybody's going to heaven is through God's grace through faith. Hmm? Faith in the finished works of Calvary and the grace of God being imputed unto us because we believed on the name above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he done for us. If you recall, I mentioned in verse 31 there are cherubim on the veil. Cherubim always shows the presence and unapproachability of Jehovah. Can I say, God has always been present, but we could not approach God until Jesus Christ died for our sins on Calvary. Hmm? Uh, we had no right to His throne, no access to His throne, no way to get to God, uh, but God made a way through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, those cherubim showed you can't get to Him, uh, but my dear friends, because of Jesus Christ, we can. Hallelujah, huh? And by the way, that's why no one else will enter in any other way. Jesus said they same be a thief or a robber. They can't get through the cherubim. The only way you get through the cherubim is through the blood of Christ. Mm. And you remember I've said a couple times that no light could pervade. When Jesus hung on Calvary for three hours, God turned off the sunlight. There was total darkness on the earth. What man did to the Son of God was so hideous, God wouldn't let man look upon him. No light pervaded. Another picture of him as the veil. Can I say, Jesus hung between two thieves. One trusted in him. Can I say, the difference between the holy place and the most holy place is Jesus Christ. And the difference between a sinner and a saint is Jesus Christ. Uh, the one trusted in him, the other didn't. I'm interested in verse 32. Look at what it says. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. Now let me start by saying silver, anytime you see that, that's always a picture of redemption. The only redemption man has is in Jesus Christ. But I'm interested where it says, And thou shalt hang it, the, the veil, upon the four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. There were hooks that held the veil in its place on the four pillars of shittim wood. When I, years ago, was studying on this veil and looking at things, I came across those words, their hooks. And that was, Brother Phil, one of those times when I'm reading the Bible and the Holy Ghost just goes, mm. You know what I'm talking about? You just know something's there. And so I studying, I was researching all about the veil and looking at things about the veil and couldn't find anything on them hooks. At that time, I did not have the library I have now, but I had a decent library. Now I've got, I don't know, 30 sets of commentaries and thousands more access because of the Internet. Back then, it didn't have all that. And I looked in every set of commentary. I looked everywhere I could look, and nobody, Brother Ray, said anything about them hooks. And then I looked in one last resource I had, old set of commentaries. Matter of fact, I've now got another one of it that's even printed earlier. The ones I got now are printed early 1800s because this set of commentaries really impressed me so much. They're the only ones that had anything on them hooks. So I want to know what them hooks were. Well, those hooks just simply, uh, the reason nobody else knew anything about it, is most commentaries, somebody writes something and everybody else just writes, rewrites what they wrote. But this old set of commentaries I had knew a little bit. This fellow knew a little bit about language and knew a little bit about things and where it writes in your King James Bible, their hooks, it originally was written in Hebrew, 
you only find this word, hooks, one other place known to man. It's in a primitive, ancient Hebrew word that has no origin. You can't research back where those hooks come from because it has no origin. But there's only one other word known to human ear that hooks has the same character and root word from. It's Jehovah. Jehovah hung the veil on Calvary. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, friend, uh, it wasn't the nails that hung Him on the cross. Uh, and contrary to the song, it wasn't His love for us uh, that hung Him on the cross. Uh, what hung Him on the cross uh, was His love for the Father uh, and the Father's will uh, for Him to die for our sins uh, is what caused Him to bleed and die uh, and make a way for you and I to be saved. Uh, Thank God that He loved us that much. That He allowed His Son to suffer that much for you and I. See, the importance of the veil, we see it in the tabernacle, we see it in typology. But you cannot mention the veil without realizing the veil was torn. Matthew 27 and verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Can I say the veil was torn? When Jesus said it is finished, and he gave up the ghost, that curtain of four to six inches thick, uh, uh, my dear friends, tore from top to bottom. You say, who tore it? God tore it. You don't rip a curtain like that, even with an earthquake. It took God to tear it. And notice how it was torn from top to bottom. If the devil would have killed Jesus, it would have been torn from bottom to top. But no, God allowed His Son to hang there. When His Son saw all things were fulfilled, He cried, It is finished! And He yielded up the ghost. And the God said, That's it! And He tore the veil from top to bottom. Uh, you remember what I said? Uh, only the high priest could go back there? Not anymore. You see, uh, only He had access. Uh, but the veil was torn to show uh, what was behind the veil wasn't important. The one who died on the cross is important. Uh, I don't need a high priest to go and offer up sacrifice for me. Uh, uh, the greatest sacrifice has already been offered. Uh, I don't need a high priest to pray for me. Uh, the veil's been rent. Uh, I can go directly to God uh, and call upon the Lord uh, because I have a mediator. Uh, I have an intercessor. Uh, Jesus, the righteous, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, ever living to make intercession for me. The veil was torn. I don't need a human agency. You say, preacher, but only the high priest. I got good news in Christ. We've been made kings and priests. I've been made a priest. I can go directly to God. And I've been made a king to rule and reign over my own flesh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. The veil was torn. I have one other thing I want to share about the veil and the importance of it. You see, there is a veil today that keeps us from seeing God. At that time, I'd take you back in Genesis. Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Adam walked with God and talked with God face to face. Adam saw God as glory. Adam saw God as everybody in the supernatural world sees God. Whether or not you believe it, I don't really care. But just beyond the veil of our eyes, there's the glory world. There's a third heaven where God calls the abode of God His home. 
His thrones in the sides of the north. Can I say Jesus is seated at His right hand. Before the throne of God, there are all kinds of angelic beings. Uh, there's archangels. Uh, there's cherubim. There's seraphim crying over the throne of God. Holy, holy, holy. Uh, uh, there's a great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before us. Uh, uh, my dear friends, uh, uh, the patriarchs are there. The prophets are there. The apostles are there. Uh, hey, uh, many of our friends and loved ones are there. Uh, they're just beyond view of human eyes. All around us tonight, and God has given charge over angels to watch over us. All around us tonight, there are demons and imps of hell trying to do everything they can to trip us up. All of that is right here within eyesight, but there's a veil to where we can't see it. Hmm. But one day, that veil is going to be terminated. Isaiah 25 says in verse 7, and he will destroy in this mountain the face of covering cast over all people. See, we've got a covering cast over us. And the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death and victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and, rebuke, and the rebuke of his people. Uh, and he shall take away from all, off all the earth... Uh, for the Lord has spoken it, uh, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him. Uh, he will save us. This is the Lord. Uh, we have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. You see, when He comes back, the veil will be removed. We'll see everything as it was meant to in the beginning. Hmm. What a blessing to know. One day we'll know. Mm. I said all that say this. If you'd been privileged to come to the brazen offer and bring your sacrifice, that'd have been a blessing. If you'd have been of the Levitical priest line or the Nethanims, you might have been blessed to even go in the holy place and see the table of showbread, see the candlestick, see the lamps that the oil was to never go out of, uh, uh, to, uh, see the incense that was burnt uh, on the altar of incense. You could have witnessed all of that. That would have been a blessing. But only the high priest got to go behind the veil to see where God really did the work. Now, in our day and age some are glad to come and enjoy the singing to enjoy the altar to enjoy the incense which is a picture of the prayers of the saints going up to enjoy looking at the veil boy isn't it pretty But did you come to go beyond that? To get to where the glory is? Very few ever come to the house of God to truly get in the glory. We're satisfied just seeing the scenery. I mean, Solomon's temple was only the most beautiful edifice ever built. I mean, everything was overlaid with gold. And see, folks coming, boy, they get, wow. And then what happens is after you've been here 20 years, you don't even remember what color the carpet is. You don't care. You just come in, sit down, get up, go home. But did you come tonight to get in the glory? Because God's waiting. He's willing. He's just looking for some who are wanting the glory. Say, where do you find the glory? When you find Him. Why stop at the pew and be satisfied with a seat when you can get all the way to Him? Hmm. You see, we get to where we go through the motions so good, the motions become the norm, and the norm has become 
powerless. This is the last time you heard of God's glory hitting a people so hard that it changed a community. I'm going to tell you, you haven't heard it. It's the early 1900s, the last time it happened in America. You know why? Because we're satisfied with just coming to church. We ought to never be satisfied till we get to Christ. You know why that banner's hanging above the door there? To remind us before we walk in, sirs, we would see Jesus. God help us to not be satisfied seeing our church family. And thank God for our church family. I love every one of them. Thank God for you. But if that's all we came out to see, we could have met at Wendy's. God help us not to be satisfied in just having a service. And I love having church services. I love singing. I love hearing folks call on God. I love hearing folks testify. I love preaching. I love hearing preaching. I love being around preaching. I love it all. But let's not be satisfied with that. God help us not to be satisfied until we go through the veil of Jesus and embrace Him. Because when we get to Him, that's when stuff starts happening on the inside. And stuff starts flowing down the outside. And gets a little bit of this going on. Uh, I've seen some do a little bit of this round. Because uh, they just get in the glory and they can't control themselves. Because he gets bigger than them. God help us to get to Christ. I'm done. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Baby, you need to come. Say, Lord, I sure would like to see you. Lord, I sure do want your touch. Lord, everything around here is great, but without you, it's just useless. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Help us to only be satisfied with Christ. Thank you for everything that the Word of God represents and shows and teaches and instructs. But God, it's all designed to point us to you. Help us, God. See your glory manifest like never before. May it transform us into your likeness that the world has to confront the fact that Jesus still changes lives. Now, God, speak to hearts in this invitation. God, if there's somebody lost, I pray you'd save them. God, I pray you'd do work. We'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.